Well, welcome back to, I think, a change of pace as the landscape architect and historian of landscape, Todd Longstaff Gowan, is going to expand our theme on the relationship between the urban fabric and health and do the example of the Charter House on the northwestern corner of the City of London, uh, a part of London where health treatment has been going on for nearly a millennium, which is uh, the date of the foundation of uh, St Bartholomew's Hospital. Um, and that St Bart's obviously grew out of a monastic ethos, uh, which then led later to the foundation of several other monastic uh, settlements, such as uh, the Charter House, uh, which remains one of London's great secret spaces. And Todd worked on the recent redesign of Charterhouse Square, and part of that work involved an archaeological dig of a plague pit. And the results of the uh, archaeological investigation have told us much about the origins, the health, the physical condition of medieval Londoners. So, Todd, over to you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, there can be little doubt that natural environments play an important role in fostering positive health benefits in an urban context. Central London has a surprising array of small to modest green spaces, all of which contribute individually and collectively to our physical, mental and social well-being. Few are, however, as capacious, distinguished or as atmospheric as the Charterhouse Estate. Stuck limpet-like to the western margin of the city, it has, against all odds, survived reasonably intact from the late Middle Ages. Next image, please. I propose briefly to explore this afternoon how a succession of custodians of this large and very green precinct have for over six and a half centuries maintained a tenacious grasp over the urban hinterland and how they've adapted it to fulfil their spiritual and temporal needs and shall conclude with an account of how a recent refurbishment of the gardens in particular and its outer precinct have resuscitated the natural environment of the estate as a whole. Next image please. The Charterhouse Estate is an unusual urban oasis. Established in the 14th century, it has retained its ancient impenetrability with its unadopted roadways, its gates in three corners and its smattering of old houses. It partakes of the air of a cathedral close, at one remove from the urban bustle nearby. It is, however, more than a mere forgotten corner of a great city. It's a place imbued with remarkable atmosphere, redolent of great antiquity and pre-Reformation monasticism. It possesses an antiquarian interest almost unrivaled in other quarters of the metropolis. Its mosaic of yards, courts, gardens, walks and orchards, and a garden square are an evocative palimpsest bearing eloquent witness to centuries of both gradual adaptation and cataclysmic reform. Next image, please. The London Charter House was founded in 1371 on a 13-acre uh, site that had been provided by the prominent soldier and diplomat Walter de Manny in 1349 for the internment of the dead at the time of the Black Death. The purchase was a pious act of spiritual redemption for many, like all God-fearing medieval Christians, believed unquestionably in purgatory. It was the purpose of life to secure salvation in the next world. The conventional establishment was developed piecemeal over many decades on monastic lands on a site immediately outside the city walls, on a little eminence adjacent to a tributary of the River Fleet. Next image, please. There were at the time few buildings in the vicinity, save three great monasteries, St Bartholomew's Hospital and Priory, St Mary's Clerkenwell and St John Clerkenwell, whose foundations dated back to the early years of the 12th century. A variety of factors contributed to the clustering of these large religious foundations on the western side of the city, among them the proximity to the city itself, and access to and control of a plentiful supply of spring water from the oozy high ground of neighbouring Islington. Next image, please. The Carthusian Order was founded around 1084 by Bruno, a cleric in Cologne who had for many years lived in France. He arrived in England in 1178 at the invitation of Henry II, 
its adherents radically embraced monasticism's ascetic roots. They were highly contemplative, and their activities emphasised personal reform and simplicity. The layout of their monasteries reflected the fact that the monks lived highly eremitical and individual lives. Although they occasionally met for spiritual conferences, their primary goal was to contemplate God in solitude and silence. They had very little or nothing to do with the outside world. The London House was among the first English suburban charter houses. Most earlier charter houses had been formed in locations far removed from the centres of population and major sources of potential disruption. Next image, please. Its layout was based on the Chartreuse de Vauvert in Paris, which occupied a site adjacent to the Luxembourg Gardens and was planned on a grand scale, a double monastery for 24 months and a prior arranged around a great cloister. As was normal practice in completed Carthusian monasteries, each monk lived in his own cell, which consisted of a house, a private latrine and a garden. In his garden, the monk meditated, cultivated and exercised. Here he in turn he turned his thoughts, pardon me, to the original garden of Eden and mankind's creation in the image of God. Next image, please. Perhaps not surprisingly, the Carthusians developed a reputation for their horticultural skill. The publication in 1786 of the solitary or Carthusian gardener by the lay brother Gentil, Francis Gentil of the Charterhouse at Paris, underscores the association of the order with progressive horticulture. And as Anna Jameson later remarked in Legends of the Monastic Orders, published in 1866, the Carthusians were first and the greatest horticulturalists in Europe. Wherever they settled, they made the desert bloom as the rose. Next image, please. As the monastery began to flourish in the late 14th century, its estate, its estate was extended with new grants of land. This ground occupied about 20 acres and was given over to a large orchard, a communal garden, a hay field, and an uncultivated miniature wilderness inhabited by rabbits and other small game. The estate's open space gave monks somewhere to garden, contemplate, and to conduct the vigorous walks that the Carthusian communi uh, communities took together after their noon meals on Sundays in order to relieve the physical and psychological pressure of confinement. The Carthusians themselves compared the monasteries to prisons, so the walled outer precincts functioned as a kind of exercise yard. Next image, please. Among the greatest and earliest practical achievements of the order was the creation of a regular and efficient water supply. In accordance with the usual medieval practice, it was obtained from a gathering ground abounding with springs roughly one and a half kilometres north of the Charter House. A detailed three metre long pictorial plan on a parchment roll with explanatory notes forms a record of the layout of the water system. It shows watercourses, windmills, wells, springs, conduits, channels and gutters. Even the direction of the water flow is colour coded, attesting to the complexity of the system. Next image, please. A range of annotations in different hands suggests that it was a working document that was kept up to date. And the fact that the plan was completely redrawn three times between 1431 and 1624 affirms a symbolic and practical importance given to the water supply and drainage arrangements by successive custodians of the estate. If water was a desideratum for the Carthusians, so too was good natural ventilation. They set great store by good, healthy air. Before entering a monastery, the individual was exhorted to give due consideration to its climate and situation. For monks, as Christ himself, Recovery is never an end in itself. The brethren were instructed to arm themselves against illness so they could serve God in health and spirit of body. Next image, please. Sadly, no amount of fresh air, water or gardening exercise spared the monks from the wrath of Henry VIII, who in 1537 brutally suppressed the London Charter House in the wake of the Act of Supremacy as is so gruesomely illustrated in this print of around 1550. This calamity precipitated the secularisation of the conventual buildings and the state and ushered in a new social order 
the buildings were stripped of their contents and fittings and adapted as storehouses, workshops and lodgings for the king's servants. And the grounds were likewise ransacked. Trees were felled, carp were taken from the ponds, birds removed from their cots, and stocks of stones and timber were carried away. Next image, please. The mixed occupation of the Charter House ended in 1545, with the acquisition of the estate by Sir Edward North and the conversion of the former priory into a private mansion. North made considerable changes to the fabric, pulling down great swathes of the early monastic buildings, reconfiguring others and raising new apartments and offices. The resultant house took on a stately character that made it a fit place for Queen Victoria, or pardon me, Queen Elizabeth, to visit at her accession in 1558 and again in 1561. Next image, please. The Agas map, shown here the 1560s, indicates that the outer precinct, the area now occupied Charterhouse Square, was dotted with a few trees, possessed a chapel, and was enclosed on two sides by buildings and on the remaining sides by walls. The buildings surrounding the yard were inhabited by a handful of laymen and members of the court circles. Next image, please. Upon North's death in 1564, the estate was acquired by Thomas Howard, 4th Duke of Norfolk, one of England's most powerful magnates. He valued the house as it stood in good air and out of the press of the city. Unlike his, unlike his former Riverside House in Lambeth and so many other great royal and aristocratic strongholds in or near London. The edge of town situation, moreover, suited the Duke who had a great disdain for life at court. And the fact that this new estate was immured and was accessible only by a single controlled gate made it feel as if it were itself an independent principality. Next image, please. The former monastery did not, however, remain a private house for long. In 1611, it was acquired by Thomas Sutton with a view to founding a great charitable institution, the Hospital of King James, founded in Charterhouse. No sooner had he acquired the estate than he flung himself into the business of turning the mansion and its almshouses into a, an almshouse into a school. Almshouses and schools were conventional outlets for philanthropic giving on a scale that Sutton was able to provide, as the elderly in need and children of the poor were regarded as the most deserving sections of society. The numbers of pensioners, called then and still now poor brothers, were set at 80 and the scholars at 40, and they latterly provided exhibitions for boys from the school at university. Next image, please. Although the estate's buildings have, may have been ill-suited for their purposes, new purposes, the grounds within the inner precinct were easily adapted. The first round of improvements took place between 1624 and 1638, and it included repairing the early water system. And when William Shellings visited the place in 1662, he found a very fine, pleasant garden with attractive walks. Although contemporary visual evidence of the layout of grounds is thought to be somewhat unreliable, it supplies us with an overview of its constituent parts, including the wilderness, the bowling green, and the privy and kitchen gardens. Next slide, please. When changes did take place to the gardens over succeeding centuries, they invariably reflected the need to make provision for spaces for school games and recreation. Among the most noteworthy reforms to the estate was the separation in 1868 of the school from the almshouse. The school was removed to Godalming in Surrey, and the eastern part of the Charterhouse estate was sold to the Merchant Taylors Company. Next image, please. I shall not here dwell on the later changes wrought to the Charterhouse's inner precinct. Suffice to say that the charity went into severe decline from the mid-19th century and the state of its grounds reflected its sorry state. I shall conclude instead by focusing on its outer precinct, or as it's now known, Charterhouse Square. Next image, please. The square began to take shape in the mid to late 17th century, although it was a, on the whole well inhabited its central yard, like so many similar open places across the metropolis, attracted a great deal of riffraff, noise and nastiness. Efforts to preserve the decency of the central area were ineffectual until it was enclosed in 1742 by a private act of Parliament. Under the new powers granted to the trustees of the square, 
the central area was metamorphosed from a barren waste into a fashionable garden. Loose, idle or disorderly persons were evicted and new rails were thrown up around the central area, which was spruced up and laid out with diagonal blocks and, plant and planted with rows of trees. Access to the garden was henceforth strictly limited to key holding residents. Next image, please. The square remained a desirable residential quarter until the mid-19th century, when the melancholic solemnity of its monkish precincts was disturbed by the cutting of a railway on the south side of the square in 1664-65, and the replanning of Smithfield Meat Market in 16, um, pardon me, 1868. The square nonetheless remained a quiet metropolitan backwater. Charles Dickens, writing in 1852, remarked on its fortified position in the heart of London, made secure by an array of iron gates and garrisoned by a well-victualled beadle. It was, he continued, nearly as quiet now, in the very core of the noisy city of London, as it was 500 years ago, when it was a lonely field bearing the name of no man's land. Next image, please. Many of the built features of the square that were so admired by the Victorians persisted until 1941, when parts of the estate were severely damaged during the Blitz. The square itself remained reasonably unscathed, although it too sustained a direct hit by a high explosive bomb. Post-war development had in fact a much greater impact on the layout of the enclosure. Most notably, the garden was decreased in size when the roadway around the square was widened to provide for roughly 100 additional car parking spaces. Next slide, please. Encompassed by high, by high modern railings, partially surrounded by regular blocks of holly hedging and shaded by a range of trees. Uh, the central garden was until recently a dull and uninteresting place and did little to complement the setting of the former priory. Indeed, the enclosure was so sterile that an ecological survey carried out in 2014 um, determined that it was comprised of habitats of, of low ecological value and was unsuitable for most protected species. The avian ecology was only marginally more interesting. Four species of bird were recorded, carrion crow, feral pigeon, blue tit and blackbird. Galvanised by a variety of factors, including the forlorn state of its landscape setting, the governors of the Charterhouse embarked in 2013 on a transformational project. It was, the, it, was a call, it was called Revealing the Charter House, to open parts of the Charter House to the public for the first time since the 14th century, and to improve dramatically the central garden and the square. I was fortunate enough to have been chosen to collaborate with them on, this, on the latter project. Next image, please. The principal aims of our landscape refurbishment were to improve significantly the quality of the Charter House precinct. Um, and the Charterhouse estate itself. Are you still there? <laughs> um, and in particular with a view to enhancing its secluded precinctual air to strengthen the visual and physical links between the square's central garden and the Charterhouse and other buildings that surrounded the Great Square, to promote greater public access to the central private garden by opening on a regular basis to increase the area of the central garden by reducing the number of car parking spaces within it and to make it more available to and more welcoming to passers-by and residents of the square itself. We also hoped to encourage greater biodiversity through the introduction of semi-natural planting around the margins of the central garden, introducing planting in a traditional uh, through traditional country hedges along the perimeter of the railings. In a nutshell, our aim was to improve the richness of the natural environment of the square with a view to enhancing the health and well-being of the residents of the Charter House and the wider community. The resultant scheme, if you could change the next slide please. The resultant scheme has been informed by an understanding of the historic development of the precinct and sensitivity to the character of the gardens. It is above all a contemporary response to the Charter House and its surroundings and the needs of a modern audience. Every effort has been made to provide reasonable access to the gardens, both physically and intellectually, 
pedestrian access has now priority through the precinct and the gardens, and vehicular movement has been kept to a minimum. The two-acre central garden is open daily when the charter house is open to the public. This access gives considerable public benefit, and the gardens, which were until recently accessible only to rate-paying residents, lie within a London borough that is deficient in public open green space. The interior of the garden, very importantly, has been increased considerably by reclaiming space until recently occupied by over 100 car parking spaces. Next image, please. The gardens have been designed for environmentally sustainable maintenance and minimal irrigation. Most of the area within the railings has been laid to grass, parts of which have been set aside and are maintained as species-rich wildflower meadow. The aim throughout has been to to maintain a rich and varied ecological structure to the gardens and to increase their biodiversity, uh, biodiversity value. The introduction of traditional English hedging, including hawthorn, blackthorn, holly, common privet, hazel, rowan and gelder rose, along the, ro uh, the roadside and the perimeter railings of the square, supplemented in stretches by densely planted broad shrubberies of native woodland species, including hawthorn, box, holly, crabapple and elder, have enhanced immeasurably the biodiversity of the square by providing habitat for birds commonly associated with woodland or woodland edge conditions. And a range of naturalizing bulbs have also been planted in the grass. Next image, please. While our various works have doubtless contributed to the improvement of the outward character of the square, what remains invisible within the landscape is equally compelling to the modern visitor. Crossrail's recent archaeological excavations confirmed what had long been alleged, but never conclusively proven, that an unknown number of plague victims lie buried beneath its velvet green sword. This discovery has piqued the public imagination and rekindled an interest in the early history of the, of the square, and certainly in the history of the Charter House and its monastic period in particular. We have found that, um, through the excavation that the mortal remains of over two dozen unfortunates, at least one of whom was thought to be a youthful Carthusian. The importance of the early origins of the square cannot be underestimated. They add a very special and intangible quality to the enclosure, an enduring quality that is reinforced by the enclave's insistent and sustained enclosure. What has been aptly described as an atmosphere of protected seclusion. Next image, please. For centuries, the enclave's gates and railings have served not only to protect it from its inhabitants, but also to create a symbolic boundary between the, found, uh, the former monastery and the outer world. Charterhouse Square is a private estate into which the public are now regularly invited. But it is at the same time an interstitial space situated between the public realm and the domestic gardens of the brothers and their own idiosyncratic interventions. To enter the gates of the square is to be transported into another world, a place of removal, a place that is conducive to meditativeness and to thinking about and reimagining the remote past. Last image please. Few images convey more succinctly and powerfully the rich history of the London Charter House than a drawing tipped into a copy of Philip Bearcroft's History of the Account of Thomas Sutton Esquire and the Foundation in Charter House, published in 1837. It depicts three standing figures in front of the old gate of the Charter House. A towering wall crowned with urns and pierced with great, a great gate, the top of which is richly encrusted with carved skulls and skeletal remains and bearing a plaque inscribed, Blessed are the dead, that die in the Lord, they rest from their labours. It is, of course, an allegory of the ages of man and serves to remind us that countless players have and shall make their entrances and exits upon this remarkable stage. But the Charter House estate is indelibly imprinted with traces of its medieval past and that these traces serve as reminders of the importance of the contemplative life as a counterbalance to the active material life. This message is intended neither to be gloomy nor melancholic, but to be positive and life-affirming. The souvenirs of the remote past prompt us to enjoy what life has to offer and what life has to give, and while we can enjoy it, 
a message that rings all too true at a time of pandemic. Thank you. Well, Todd, thank you very much for transporting us to um, what I, I think I mentioned, I, I, I think is one of London's great secret spaces, but for making it less secret, both by your work as a designer with the Charter House themselves, but also by your uh, description of it. One of the things that really interests me about um, the Charter House, I think, is uh, what you said, that, that it became known as a place for horticulture. Um, and the idea that you can grow things in the city, which is a subject that we've d um, had several other presentations which have touched on today, um, but also the idea of ventilation, good water supply. In a sense, what the Charter House was doing in the late 14th century is everything that we are thinking about now in how we improve the urban environment. Absolutely. They were um, very much ahead of their time. And I suppose because they were, like so many of these religious communities, um, wishing to be reasonably independent, um, they required to think about all these things. And in fact, insofar too, I mean, whereas many of the monastic orders around London were more interdependent, the Carthusians really, although they relied on other neighbouring monasteries to supply them with water as well as other things, they tapped into their water system, for instance, um, they still persisted in this idea of, of trying to keep a, a great degree of independence. And interestingly, um, they, were, um, they were very, very concerned, obviously, in, in, in health, as you say, and water and good ventilation were two of the most important aspects of this. But they were among the first communities to um, quarantine themselves in the advent of plague and things like that as well. So they really did have, um, I mean, they were by nature uh, quite eremitical, but they did, um, they did uh, practice what they preach, so. And I think another thing that's, that's fascinating about the Charter House is not, not only its accidental survival, but also its relationship to uh, its neighbours. And of course, as you were saying, St Bartholomew's Hospital in Priory was itself a monastic settlement, um, which has now become part of the National Health Service. Um, Smithfield, the, the meat market, was there, I believe, when the Charter House was founded, and is still there, it's still where you know, much of London's meat Absolutely. is uh, bought, at least at wholesale level. And I, I, I think that this sort of survival of both monasticism, or monasticism, healthcare, and um, meat supply um, <laughs> is, 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 a, is a fascinating uh, story of that part of London, because of course, that part of the city escaped the fire in 1666, I think, which is partly mm. why it survived. There are a few other survivals around mm. there. It's, it's, in fact, it's very curious that um, the Carthusians sort of established themselves by the meat market because um, they, they didn't eat meat. <laughs> in fact, one of, the big, um, <laughs> one of the big tenets of their diet and one of the reasons it was said that the Carthusians, among all monastic orders, had the longest, uh, had the great longevity. In fact, they had disdained from eating meat. Mm. Um, mm. So that was a strict dietary um, provision. From the earliest possible earliest days so it is quite it is quite ironical they were indeed next door to this enormous meat market um but um, mm. yes it's true i think it's it's still i think uh, as someone who works in that particular quarter of london it still is it still has this rather amazing fabric as you as you say it's it probably has the strongest evocation of any in any part of london of its medieval past and um one can still walk by the order of st john and st bart's as you say these these three great monastic institutions still survive, although much changed, but the land they occupy is still quite large. And um, it is fascinating that they have miraculously survived. Yes, and, and I think this layering of history, um, because in some ways, although as you were saying, the Charter House um, was changed very significantly after the dissolution of, of the monastery and then by subsequent owners <clears throat> um, up to um, what's happened in the last few years that you've been involved with, but it's probably still the most recognisably uh, antiquarian uh, 
piece of, of, of that immediate part of London, with the, I suppose the other place would be um, um, St. Bartholomew the Great Church, but the, the hospital has transformed out of all recognition, um, not least by you know, the magnificent work by the great um, Baroque architect James Gibbs, um, which was explicitly for the hospital as opposed to for the, for, for, for the monastery. Um, what but is there, the there's one point. Sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say yes. that it is. Yes. I mean, they still have an eight-acre estate, and that the mm. that unusually for a London square, they also um, they own the entire precinct. So it is when you enter the gates into Charterhouse Square, you're entering into the, the old precinctual um, areas of the mm. of the monastery, and the fact that that's still owned and maintained by the Charterhouse as a private estate and private road is unusual in, in any London context for a London square. So uh, you get this, and then having all those small and, and large and rather idiosyncratic gardens that happen behind the walls, um, which are not open to the public, um, really makes this estate uh, quite, a, quite a remarkable estate. It makes it very intriguing to walk past it because now, you know, as, as you were saying, it is possible to go into it, which was very difficult in the past, but um, you still don't get whole access to it. So one does still find there are these secret parts to it, which I, I think is remarkable. But one, one thing um, that strikes me about this is that this is um, really a, a, a very rare example in London of something that I think was common to English medieval cities because uh, unlike um, uh, cities on the continent, the cathedrals very often included monasteries. And this was um, started by Alfred, uh, King Alfred in the, um, what was that, 9th century. William the Conqueror in the 11th century also followed this, this practice of putting the monastery and cathedral together, which meant that there would be in centres of population, i.e. cities. And what that meant was that English cities, certainly those before um, the uh, Renaissance and before the early modern period, <clears throat> had the whole horticultural and even agricultural apparatus of a monastery right up in the city centre, right next to the cathedral. And you see this in, 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 you know, around the, the many medieval um, cities or many cathedral cities in England. And it seems to me that London was the exception, or uh, one of the exceptions, where its cathedral, St Paul's, didn't have a monastery attached to it. But, it. but it was these other monastic orders, like the Charter House, that brought that sense of um, horticulture and agriculture into the city uh, in a way that I think is one of the unique features of, of British cities. Absolutely. And as you saw on, on one of the illustrations, I showed the monastic institutions that um, thrived in and around London in the um, up to the dissolution and there were a great number and they were um, increasing in size uh, right until their suppression in the early 16th century they were always on the lookout to extend their estates uh, with a view to actually increasing cultivation and to having you know, um, greater agrarian areas so it was um, absolutely incumbent on these people to do that and very often these are, um, for instance when the chart house was formed it was actually it was um, formed on land that had previously all of, uh, already been in monastic occupation by St. Bart's and also the Abbey at Westminster. Mm. So they, the, they, these great monastic institutions actually owned quite a lot of land and they just were, they were willing and able to sell the partition of parts of their estates to new forming um, uh, orders like the Carthusians who arrived actually quite late in the scene in, in the 12th century. Yes, and of course, um, we're um, speaking from a studio in Spitalfields, um, in sort of East London, a little bit east of the Charter House, but, but not very far away. Um, and a lot of uh, Spitalfields was monastic lands, as you were saying, being gradually accumulated or reallocated or redistributed right up until the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1550s, 1530s. Sorry, but it's interesting how the patterns of land ownership um, still persist now and even if the monastic uses have, have left the boundaries of these different monastic estates are still there in the urban fabric 
absolutely. I think that um, uh, Julian Tyndall wrote that wonderful book on Kentish Town, which talks about the roads beneath Kentish Town. And I've always liked this idea. One thing that's remained constant in London's history, like so many towns and cities, really are roads and, and um, rights of way. Because once they're set down, they seldom change. So when one wanders through the city, and especially in and around the Charter House, you get a sense of what the medieval pattern, road pattern was like. And, and very often it's reflected, as you say, old um, field boundaries and rights of way that have been there for thousands of years. And so that one doesn't necessarily always see these things, but like the archaeological remains of the unfortunates who died in the plague, they had this remarkable piquancy to, to our views of these areas. And I think also what's certainly true of the Charter House is the survival of the, of the plague bit, because it was one of these areas, like so many around London, that wasn't built upon, um, really preserved the integrity of the, of the greatest part of the estate. Yeah, and um, but really, sort of following on from that, um, one sees what enormous disruption the Underground Railway caused, um, which runs just on the edge of the estate, as you were saying. Um, and that was, of course, the first Underground Railway in in London, I believe, from from um, Farringdon to Paddington. And uh, <coughs> yeah. yes, and I. I suspect that that had something to do with the school moving out of the Charter House itself, moving to its uh, location outside London in the six, 1860s. Absolutely. I mean, I think also the Charter House was by this time on their uppers and um, they were offered a substantial sum by the Merchant Taylors. So I think that it was um, thought rather than sort of dissolving, they'd actually thought of moving the entire institution out of London itself, which mm. would have been disastrous. But they did remain and just carved off, which is a terrible loss, of course, the Great Cloister, which was the largest um, part of the existing, uh, the old monastery, which was demolished as late as 18, you know, the late 1860s or early 1870s. So it's tragic. Only one spur, which is rather now um, mm. a little bit forlorn, remains, but you still get a sense of what the cloisters originally looked like. And I believe it was that demolition that started um, a, a, a new wave of antiquarian interest, uh, which was um, uh, exemplified by the foundation of, of a photographic society, which was specifically founded to photograph buildings which were under threat. And I think that it, some of its earliest photographs of the 1860s are of the Charter House. Absolutely. It's been at the forefront of, yeah. sort of London life since the... Uh, yeah. since the uh, 13th century, but I'm um, still hidden away. <laughs> it's, in fact, it's so true, as you say, that um, most Londoners have never heard of the Charter House. And um, yet, when you stand in the square or in the back of its most uh, sort of secretive quarters, you, 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 the towers of the Barbican loom right over the whole institution. So it's not as if it's, it's um, very far away from the hubbub of the, of the city. Yes. And of course, as you say, even from the moment of its foundation, it was uh, very close both to the, to, the, to the hospital, which I guess was increasingly um, delivering um, uh, early forms of medical treatment and, and, and to the meat market. But I think it is one of those places, it's, its survival may be accidental, but we are incredibly lucky that it survives because as you say, it gives us the opportunity for contemplation in and of itself, but also a contemplation of London's deep and very rich uh, both architectural and spiritual past. So, Todd, thank you very much for describing the Charter House to us. Thank you.